Good evening, everybody. Uh, my, I am John Schreiber, and uh, I'm the CEO of the Art Center, and I'm happy to welcome you to a virtual version of the Art Center's long-running Conversations with Cooperman series. Uh, I thank you uh, for joining us uh, to hear from one of NJPAC's best friends and supporters, um, a, a leader in the world of finance, investing, and purposeful philanthropy, uh, Lee Cooperman. Uh, also want to thank our sponsor, uh, uh, Kevin Cummings of Investors Bank, for supporting this series of fascinating talks between Lee and executives in the worlds of banking, commerce, and politics. Um, uh, before we uh, start our program, I want to tell you about a few future initiatives you uh, may also find interesting, and they're all virtual. On Thursday, October 22nd at 9 a.m., our next Business Partners Roundtable at Home, online Zoom conversations uh, with New Jersey's executives and thought leaders will continue with a discussion of how the pandemic has affected real estate. We have a terrific panel of uh, real estate professionals joining us, including Paul Silverman, who's the leader of the Jersey City-based Silverman Building Company, uh, Joe Taylor, the CEO of Matrix Development Group, Adina Bayo, um, a real estate developer here in Newark, who was also an IHOP franchise owner and the, and the owner of a spectacular farm-to-table soul food restaurant called Cornbread, and Mimi Feliciano, who's the founder and CEO of FEM Real Estate, uh, an investment company uh, in Central Jersey. So look out for an email invitation this week. Um, our colleagues at NJTV uh, have asked me to let you know they are holding their inaugural American Cities Rebuilding virtual conference next week on Thursday, October 15, and Friday, October 16. The conference will explore the many challenges and opportunities facing cities like Newark in the midst of both the pandemic and the struggle for social justice. This conference will take a deep dive into the new urban economy, uh, public health, education, and more. And you can find details for this uh, at the WNET website, wnet.org slash cities. Uh, and happily, Lee will be back with us at noon on Thursday, November 5th, for another online conversation with Cooperman. This time he'll be joined by James Gorman, chairman and CEO of Morgan Stanley, and look out for an invitation in your email from us for that. Um, you can find out information about those events and the dozens of other uh, virtual uh, conversations, social justice initiatives, arts education opportunities, if you visit our website, njpec.org. Um, tonight, we are pleased to be reunited with Lee via Zoom. We've held these chats in person at the Art Center for many years, and, uh, uh, and happily we're continuing them virtually. A word about your host. A few years ago, Lee and his family made a transformative gift to the Art Center of $20 million. That gift enabled us to begin work on a new education and community center, the Cooperman Center, that'll house all of our work in arts education uh, and also include a wellness facility, a black box theater, a children's library, a cafe where kids are taught culinary arts, rehearsal spaces for nonprofit performing arts organization and programs for everyone from babies to older adults. We expect to break ground on the Cooperman Family Arts Education and Community Center in the next 18 months and we're really excited about the value it'll provide. Tonight, Lee is gonna be talking to Michael Corbett, who has served as the CEO of Citigroup since 2012. Michael has worked at Citi or its predecessor company since he graduated from Harvard in 1983. Lee will tell you more about Michael's impressive and impactful career in a moment. We'll have time for a few questions at the end of the discussion, so please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen to submit questions for Lee and Michael. And now Lee, with that- Thank you very much for your gracious welcome. introduction. Uh, let me just say in advance, if there's any foul up, it's 100% me. I participated with Toby in your virtual gala Saturday night, and we were both extremely impressed by how flawless it went. Yep. And very Thank enjoyable, you. very well done. So if there's something that doesn't go right tonight, you know we're the place to blame. 
Terrific. Yeah. I appreciate that. Uh, have, a, have, a, have a good show. See you right. later. Break a leg, as they say. Yes. Anyway, let me extend a hearty uh, thank you and welcome to Mike Corbett. Uh, we th thank you for extending yourself and virtually crossing the Hudson River to share your wisdom. Uh, I didn't plan on giving you a lengthy introduction, uh, but I think you deserve one. You know, Mike is the CEO of Citigroup, the world's global bank. Uh, I should disclose I'm a stockholder, a meaningful stockholder. They have approximately 200 million customer accounts and activities in more than 160 countries and jurisdictions. He has been at Citi and predecessor company since his graduation from Harvard in 1983. Um, when in 1983, I was a partner at Goldman and Mike was a formidable uh, uh, competitor, uh, did an outstanding job. Uh, prior to becoming CEO, he was a CEO of Europe, uh, Middle East, and Africa, um, and he's overseen, overseen cities' business operations in that region, including consumer banking, corporate and investment banking, securities and trade, and private banking services. He's also a member, had a number of positions at Solomon, uh, his the predecessor company, uh, which was uh, merged into Citibank and he was a managing director with roles in emerging markets, high yield and derivatives. So, you know, I envy your decision to retire. I appreciate it. Uh, you announced your retirement in September. This will take effect uh, uh, next February. Can you help us understand the rationale behind the move? Why now? And do you have a next chapter planned? Sure, well, well Lee, good evening to you. Thanks for having me. Hello to all the NJPAC supporters. Um, having spent a, a, a lot of, of my life in New Jersey and um, both our children born there, it's certainly got a special place for us. So, so thank you. Um, if you know, you've ever kind of had a chance to hear me speak historically, I've always talked about and been a steadfast believer in terms of what I describe as term limits for big public companies. As you just said, uh, I'm getting ready to, to uh, approach my 38th year at our company. Um, I'm crossing the mark in terms of eight years as CEO for our company. And I've always really had my eye on retirement in 2021 for some time. I can't point to any one specific thing that has led me to um, my decision, but I would say along the way, I was influenced by many factors. First, at our investor day in 2017, uh, we embarked on a three-year plan that would take us through the end of 2020. Uh, with COVID, that's, that's obviously changed some things, but I very much kind of wanted to see that through. I think second, very importantly, I have a fantastic Ready Now successor. Jane Frazier, who maybe some of you have read about her or know a bit, uh, has been in her role as president uh, for over a year. We put her in that role anticipating she would succeed me. Uh, she's, uh, I think, done a terrific job there. And candidly, I, I think she's ready. So over the next four or five months, she and I are going to work together on that transition, something that, that I, I didn't necessarily have the benefit of, something that's, that's important to me. And I would say, thirdly, that um, uh, I'm proud of all that we've accomplished at City. But at the same time, there's more work to be done to move city forward. And, you know, as an example, today, we had our regulators come out and give us an order around expediting some longstanding issues that we've had. And we're, um, I would say, very disappointed that we, we let them down, but we're completely committed to taking that forward. And I know Jane's going to do a, a terrific job in terms of doing that. And then I'm sure we'll get into it this evening. But I think as, as we come out of COVID, and as the world goes forward, I think there's some, some things that the financial services industry, certainly city, is going to be doing different. And so I think it's a great time for the next generation to be taking the reins and really taking our 200-year-old company into its next chapter. Good. Well, as you look back over your tenure, what are the, your proudest accomplishments? Well, I, I think one, and you know, as you said, Lee, you've been a, a shareholder. And if you look back at our company, I think you know, along the way, uh, we got into a lot of different things. So I would say one thing is um, proud of is really what I would describe as returning us back to the basics of banking and investing in the parts of the business that we believe will continue to distinguish us in the years and, and decades to come. I think as a test of that, um, as our results um, uh, you know, have Im improved our focus uh, along the way, I think cities become a simpler, stronger, uh, firm, and I think we've improved the quality and consistency of, of our earnings. 
and significantly increasing our returns for our investors. Uh, from 2012, when I took over, net income was about seven and a half billion dollars. Last year, it was just under 20 billion. Uh, our return on tangible common equity when I took over was 5%. Last year, it was just above 12%, I think, closing the gap with the peers. We went from hardly returning any capital in 2012 to returning nearly $80 billion over the last six years. And I think all the hard work we put in is uh, showing itself in, in terms of COVID and the things that, that you know, we've been able to do. And importantly, the role that we've played in terms of not just in the US, but around the world, supporting the government programs that have been so important, continuing to support our customers and clients. You spoke about the numbers. Uh, of them, and at the same time, I think delivering solid underlying business results, despite what I think we would all describe as a, uh, a highly challenging environment. So I'm uh, proud of the to be proud. That our people I'll have shown, you. and um, uh, I think we've got great management in place, as I said, to lead into the next generation. I, when I speak to a lot of people that have trouble understanding the stock market versus their perception of what's going on in the economy, you operate in every major region of the world. You have a diverse set of both consumer and corporate businesses. From your viewpoint, what is the health of the global economy today? And which ge geographies are you most constructive on? Sure. So I think one is we've got to understand that um, we are in the midst of a health crisis. And that health crisis has significant economic ramifications which are severe. And I don't think we can really look at resolving the economic challenges until we, under, until we resolve the underlying public health crisis. And I think that's why testing and social distancing and uh, all the searches for medical interventions are so critical. I would say as a result of um, COVID-19, we are seeing low, lower growth expectations globally. Our economists now are um, anticipating or predicting GDP in 2020 to decline by roughly three and a half percent with a more pronounced decline expected in the developed markets of about five percent and the emerging markets declining maybe about a percent and a half. But, but in there, I think we should continue to, to see a, a, a fair amount of, of choppiness. Um, I would say as part of that, we uh, continue to have very accommodative central bank policies in the US and around the world. And there's a lot of stimulus being pumped into the system, uh, including over $2 trillion in funding stimulus right here in the US. And we've seen very similar programs in, in Europe uh, and the UK. I, I would say from our, our global view and our global reach, what it's meant to us is that we've actually been able to see firsthand how COVID-19 has unfolded around the world. As an example, we were actually a, a very early, a first mover in many ways, um, having lived with some of the challenges of COVID in China and in our Asia franchise, and therefore got the playbook together pretty early in terms of how we would carry that around uh, the rest of the world. And I think the insights that we get from our business in terms of what back to the office means, uh, some of the remote things that we've done, uh, I think have, uh, from a global perspective, really, um, really, really benefited us. And I would just say that, you know, in the U.S. overall, um, the, um, the extensions that we've seen out of the Fed, uh, the actions that we've seen out of Treasury uh, have manifested themselves in higher savings rates. And we're not really seeing significant, thankfully, significant signs of stress amongst our clients. But at the same time, I, I think we all have to recognize that it's early and that many have benefited from significant stimulus. And we've got to see how COVID plays forward and how those programs potentially play forward. Right. Uh, this is really the first real world stress test we've had since 2008. Uh, how would you rate the performance of your industry uh, during 2020? And I, I think you've addressed Citigroup in particular, but if any additional comments you want to make about Citigroup. Sure. So, so again, Lee, going back to, you know, what's different here is that uh, this, this is not a financial crisis. This is a health crisis, a public health crisis that has clearly significant financial ramifications. Uh, this time, um, the, the financial institutions industry, the banking industry goes into this as a source of strength, 
capital, liquidity, uh, resiliency, and um, I think the important role that we've played is not just the role in terms of our day jobs and supporting our customer clients, but um, the ask from not just the U.S., but governments all around the world to bring these programs to life. So whether it's PPP, whether it's the stimulus checks, uh, you know, whether it's forbearance programs that we've been offering and really trying to act as that important intermediary between uh, central banks and governments and the real economy. And I think having the banks this time as a source of strength, uh, I think has, has made a significant difference in, in this. And, and as I said, that you know, City went into this from a position of strength, and I think so far have managed our way through this in a, uh, in, in a very capable and, um, uh, and I think a strong way. While there's intense market focus on what the Fed is doing, with short rates, they are also increasing their balance sheet to minimize the effects of COVID-19. And this impacts bank cash balances, deposits, and liquidity. Can you talk about the impact of Fed policy on your clients and what impact or risk that you see longer term from Fed intervention in markets broadly? First, I have a view on that. We're, like your... we're very appreciative of all the, the U.S. agency's efforts as the pandemic has unfolded. And I would say that the Federal Reserve, in particular, Treasury as well, I think were very decisive and very swift in their actions of what they were doing. They came in first and went at liquidity in the markets and made sure that the markets stayed open and functioning and pretty quickly realized, and again, we were in constant dialogue with them, that it was important to also be shoring up and putting facilities in place around credit during uh, the difficult times. And I think those programs uh, have served as well. Some, some have, have actually had very little use, but the fact that they're there, I think gives the market uh, a, lot of, uh, a, lot of, a lot of confidence. Um, I think um, as part of that, the um, place where we are today, um, you know, we've seen really unprecedented levels of uh, volumes and activity at times. And I would really say throughout all of this, the markets have stayed, you know, very open and functioning. And, I, and again, I think that's, uh, that's a, a real testament to the work that's been done. Um, but at the same time, I would say that, you know, given the continued uncertainty around, you know, certain areas. So as an example, um, state and local government budgets and tax revenues, um, I think it's going to be important for the Fed to continue to maintain some of these facilities. And again, well, I'm sure we'll talk a bit about it, but um, you know, I don't think we're out of the woods or we should declare ourselves out of the wood, the woods in terms of COVID. And, and again, I think the, the value of these programs in terms of, uh, of calming and you know, having that sense of backstop there have been, been critical to the markets. I don't know if my focus is wrong, but I, I, my own, I don't have clients anymore, thankfully, because it's such a tough environment. I'm just running my own funds. But I keep asking myself, who pays for the party when the party is over. I agree that the Fed is doing what they should do, but I say to myself, we just celebrated our 244th anniversary as a nation. We won some zero national debt to 21 trillion in 244 years. That number is going up three or four trillion a year now, a growth rate far in excess of the growth rate of the economy. So it seems to me more and more of our national income is gonna have to be devoted to debt service. Now we're getting away with it now because interest rates are negative or zero, but you know, I don't. I hope that's not a permanent condition. But that would mark the end of capitalism. There ought to be a return on capital. But so, uh, am I wrongly focused, worrying about the future? No, I, I think I think you're you're spot on. That we've got to pay attention to to uh, how much uh, how much we end up burdening the future in terms of trying to um, do the best we can do through challenging times today. And I think that's some of the discourse of the dialogue that's going on in Washington and other places today around actually what, what, what's affordable and what are the longer term um, ramifications of that. And I think clearly that um, not just the U.S., but many governments around the world went into this crisis, this health crisis, with bloated balance sheets, uh, with the prospects of slower growth and with a lack of willingness or ability necessarily to make uh, tough fiscal cuts. 
And so I think we've got some important decisions ahead of us. One person's opinion, I think it's highly likely that we will see uh, changes to uh, tax structures at both the city, state, and federal levels uh, that are probably going to be necessary to, to offset uh, some of this spending that's going on or, or some of this you know, fiscal adjustment that, that's going on. Uh, but I think we've absolutely got to keep an eye on it. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I have a religious belief on this subject. You know, I believe in the progressive income tax structure. I believe rich people should pay more in taxes. And what we have to do as a nation is coalesce around the question, what should the maximum tax rate be on wealthy people? Because that will define the revenue yield to the government and the government should size that revenue yield, to, to, they should size their activities to that revenue yield. So if you talk to Bernie Sanders, he would say 90% marginal tax rate. If you talk to Elizabeth Warren, she would probably say 70. I spoke directly with Paul Krugman and he said 64%. You know, I myself, I'm willing to work six months a year for the government, six months to myself. 50% feels about right. Well, if you live in New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, California, you're already well past 50%. So I don't know, I don't know where they get the money from. Uh, and I, uh, you know, we're going to get a referendum in a few weeks. Uh, I know I you think, can't I think Lee is part of that, you know, that we've seen um, in here, and it, it's it's certainly been on the docket, and I had some conversations in Washington today. But but many cities, New York City is an example, is under severe stress in terms of uh, its revenue, the revenue side of the balance sheet. Right, the expenses are there; they're still paying teachers. They've got to pay um, police and fire and all of those, and obviously receipts are down. And so uh, again, I think we we're going to have to look at. Uh, new and creative ways of passing the hat, like you. Uh, you say six months. I always say that you know I'm okay working to lunchtime on Wednesday um, for the Fed or the city or the state. Um, beyond Same that, I'm not that keen Same on. But, but I think the the inevitable reality around the numbers is it's it's likely to start bleeding into Thursday and hopefully not Friday. Yeah. The thing that I find most amazing. I don't want you to give away the family secrets. But when I came to Wall Street in 1967. Goldman traded stocks for 45 or 50 cents a share. Commissions are now near zero. Okay, interest rates are near zero. How do you, how do you make $20 billion? Well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. So, so one is that, you know, when you, you, you look at the model, clearly um, that low or in some cases where we operate, operate around the world, um, negative interest rates aren't new. Right. And from a bank perspective, you know, you know, I guess it was the uh, certainly before my era, uh, it was the, the three, six, three model of banking, you know, uh, take deposits at three percent, lend them at six percent and beyond the golf course by three. Um, today, it's, you know, um, negative interest rates. And so there's not much in terms of economics there. And I think what you've seen is, you know, the model skewing or developing towards more fee based income. And I think being more mindful of that. And so we've been uh, on the wealth management side of things, on the transaction processing side of the things, continuing to emphasize and build those business that gives us more diversification against the traditional spread based or, or interest rate sensitive parts uh, of our business. And, and as part of that, I think the, uh, the geographical mix that we have, while interest rates are low to negative in much of the developed world, you know, there still are some, um, some interest rates out there in the emerging market parts of the world where we operate or some steepness to the yield curve that does give us the ability in those jurisdictions to, uh, to capitalize on spread. Do you, through your connections at the bank, have any view of how COVID-19 virus will play out? Over the next 12 months, do you think that we're going to come up with a solution? I, I talk every day to my good buddy, Ken Langone, who is a wonderful human being and a perennial optimist. And he says, NYU Langone is working with four companies that should have a solution before the end of the year. So he's an optimist on that. Uh, do you share that optimism? Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I, I, I am an optimist by nature. But I would say that the way that, that I've thought about things and the way that we've tried to, I think, do things at, at our company is less by date, but on data. And I think we've been very you know, data driven in terms of the decisions that we made around our business and the safety of our people. And if I think of that timeline, rather than put a date on it, 
I would put some milestones. And you know, simplistically, the way I think about it is, I think there's three, three phases to this. So the first phase would be around containment. And that's you know, around work remotely, that's around social distancing, that's around all the things that we can do to slow the pace and the trajectory of the spread. I would say the second bucket or, or the second part of time is around uh, what I would call sustainability. And that is as we bent that contagion curve and we've gotten spread, hospitalization, mask utilization, or uh, ventilator utilization, all of those things down, that we can become comfortable that we've stabilized at lower levels and we're not gonna see a resurgence to that. Mm -hmm. The third phase is what I would call the return to normalization. And, you know, I think a simple test around normalization, you know, am I, am I willing to uh, get on a, a, an airliner? Am I willing to go to a, a performance at the NJ Pack? Am I uh, willing to go to a sporting event or whatever those things are? And I think when you think about where we are today, my own view is I think we are somewhere in the late stages of containment and the um, unproven stages of sustainability, right? We're waiting to see in the fall as schools reopen uh, and people try to, to, to start getting parts of their lives back, what happens? And I think, you know, to, to the optimist Ken Langone, I don't think we normalize realistically un, until we get a vaccine. I think right. testing and rapid testing helps in terms of uh, trying to give us comfort in a move towards normalcy, but I really don't think we get normalcy until we get uh, um, vaccine. And I think the challenge certainly, Lee, in the conversations that I've had, and you've probably had them, is it feels like we're probably not that far from a, a vaccine, but you know, in my conversations with the pharma companies, it's more about how quickly we can get it out there and we can get it scaled and you know the conversations I've had is is that's not going to be an overnight thing. So um, I think we look forward to to the vaccine and hopefully not in the too, too distant future. But I think we've got to be prepared that um, you know we're not going to get it out everywhere we want to get it for uh, for a little bit. Thank you. Maybe we could switch gears a little bit and talk about financial technology. Uh, Twenty years from now, what do you think banking will look like today? There's I guess in the United States, 5,700 banks, roughly 88,000 branches. The top 10 banks control 50% of the nation's deposits and digital banking appears to be accelerating. Uh, how do you think the evolution of the industry is going to play out? Will non-bank players make a significant dent in the market, in market share? Well, I think first we've got to recognize that there, there's likely extraordinary upsides to these new technologies and the changes they can help bring about. And I think we all have a responsibility to figure out how our companies, our governments and our clients can capture as much of that upside as possible while mitigating some of the potential downside risks. One of the things we talk about in, in our company is that increasingly our customers and clients are comparing and expecting that their banking service you know, is in line with best of luck. Today, it's not about being best in banking. It's about matching those best in life experiences and making things as, e as easy and as seamless um, as possible. I would say our clients, institutions and consumers alike um, want us to be where they are uh, and they expect easy, seamly access to our products and services through digital and mobile channels. And I think by the way, COVID has only accelerated that. Right, right. That if you, you, you look at, you know, whether it's Citi or JP or, or Wells Fargo, that, you know, we, we've all uh, made the choice to, to um, uh, slim down the number of branches that we have. You know, and I, I've always said that, you know, when I, I think of our industry and our company, we're, we're on what I call a, a big transition. And that is uh, a transition of continuing to run, but winding down the analog bank and at the same time, continuing to build the digital bank. Right. And you know, when you think of the continuum of clients that we serve, you know, range from the, the teens through the millennials, you know, to you and I. Right. And I think you and I, you know, like to know the branches there, like to know there's someone to talk to if we want. But at the other end of the spectrum, um, there's not necessarily that interest in branch banking or that human interaction. And I think COVID has pulled that forward. 
So my expectation is you're going to continue to see an acceleration toward digital, uh, which I think is, is quite positive. Uh, I think you'll continue to, uh, to see new entrants and new partners coming into the space, which uh, I think creates good competition and good service. And I, you know, as I described, I think we're in the early chapters uh, or the early pages of the next chapter of banking. And I think it's all about digital. So you would look at this as being complementary rather than disruptive. I do. I do. Because again, you know, when you think of that continuum and you think of the economics of a bank, you know, you're a, you're a terrific client, right? And, you know, we- I don't we know. Do I don't borrow any money. We, uh, but, you know, you, you invest, you do different things, you keep deposits with us. You know, you, you do those things. Um, and, and I would say that, the, you know, our, our younger clientele, right, household formation starting later, borrowing starting later, much more interested in life experiences around that. And um, we've got to manage that full continuum in there. But again, I think, I think um, the transition is, is accelerating. And I think, you know, COVID, is, COVID has certainly helped that. Uh, uh, Google, Apple, Facebook are adding financial services functionality. Uh, how do you view what they're up to? Uh, what do you think their ultimate aspirations are? Well, um, again, in there that, you know, many, many of those are very, very large clients and in, in, you know, a number of those cases, partners with Citi. You know, we announced a Google partnership uh, around, you know, um, linking our bank accounts to their search and buy platform that, that, you know, they think and we think is pretty powerful. But, you know, I think that as we think of banking, uh, I think it would be, be naive to have the belief that the financial world today is, you know, remains an exclusive club for bankers. I think big techs and big techs are major bankers. And I would say, candidly, we, we welcome those partnerships. I would say we look to partner with the fintechs and the, and the big techs to co-create and bring the best of the outside in wherever possible. And I think that's a, a partnership that makes sense for both sides. And I think that the bigger risk is not them coming, it's not embracing uh, that they are coming and looking to figure out ways where we can use each other's strengths and, and capability. So, uh, our presence in more than 100 countries, our brand, our scale, and at the same time, using their, their technology, their different approaches, their disruptive approach to thinking about business new and new and different ways. So, uh, you know, I think that uh, I remember, I, I'll tell a story that, you know, uh, six, seven years ago, I went out to Silicon Valley and I, I sat down and um, had lunch with one of the, the fintech companies and the fellow said to me pretty much paraphrasing I'm coming to eat your lunch old man and you know I said well we certainly respect that we're, we're not dismissive but at the same time you know anytime you want to trade at a 10 times multiple and be highly regulated we'd love to have you as part of the industry 10 times would be an uptick I think well yeah that was that was then and 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 again I think that you know as as they've looked and as we've looked I think there's some great alliances and great partnerships that can be formed uh, as part of this. And we're absolutely, absolutely taking advantage of those as we speak. It seems like mobile payments penetration has been higher in the emerging markets. And I believe your CityPay product was launched in the emerging markets first. Perhaps you could talk about your view on mobile payments and how it will proliferate, proliferate in the future. And are we moving to an all digital banking system in the future? Well, I think your point in the emerging markets is absolutely right, but uh, I think you've got to kind of go back and kind of look at the, um, the, that statement from the infrastructure point. And that is that in many cases, um, the bricks and mortar hasn't been there and that many of these places have simply bypassed bricks and mortar to mobile. And you know, the ability in many of those markets to get to the unbanked or the underbanked and to be able to provide those services. And so as opposed to building the branch to create that connectivity via mobile, I think has been, has been quite powerful. And we've seen digital adoption rates uh, you know, going up exponentially, I think, which is exciting because as we can bring those people into um, the banked universe, uh, you know, we've seen the societal benefits really of, of what that means. And, 
And I think as part of that, we're certainly accelerating in the developed markets as well. And so I think a, a lot of the things that we're learning in those developing or those emerging markets, we're certainly um, taking and bringing back and using and utilizing in, in the more traditional banking space. I, I assume as you retire, you'll retire with a large position in Citibank stock. I think according to the data I've looked at from S&P, they've underperformed eight of the last 10, underperformed eight of the last 10 years. What do you think changes that? Positive slope yield curve, uh, you know, solutions yeah, I think Well, one is I think that's banks. Banks broadly have, have, have right, underperformed. Exactly. And, and I think that in some ways goes back, Lee, to, you know, coming out of um, the last crisis, right? We, we learned some important lessons. And when you go back and look at banking historically, it was a fairly highly levered business or, or, or industry. You know, historically, you know, um, going into the crisis, banks were running at sometimes, you know, 25, 35 times levered. You know, today banks are running at approximately 10 times levered. So we've seen the returns of the industry come down. So I would say that's, that's one. Um, second is that we've been in an environment where we've seen interest rates uh, other than for brief periods, uh, you know, around what we described from, from a banking perspective, rates coming down. And that's more challenging. And obviously that, that certainly eats at your top line. And I think that's, you know, for some institutions been challenging to overcome. And, you know, we've seen increased regulation and increased intervention by the regulators and whether it's been stress testing or, you know, impositions around capital, capital returns or other pieces that's been there. And so I think the, you know, investing universe is trying to kind of figure out um, how to value and understand bank franchises and over the longer cycle, what the earnings power and capabilities and return capabilities and the stability of these institutions are. So uh, I think it, it takes a while to work through that cycle and for people to have a full cycle perspective of, 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 of what that means. Yeah. The market is very fickle. Six months ago, every day, the market fluctuated violently based upon the news coming out of China. I can't imagine the economic news being any worse given our trade relations. You know, given your position in trade finance lending, and the company's presence in international markets, what are you seeing as the potential lasting impacts of these ongoing trade wars between the US and other countries, especially China? Well, I think in some ways, Lee, we've got to go back and kind of understand what in many cases is underlying um, trade wars or, or however we want to describe it. And I think one is, you know, I was very struck, I remember traveling um, it was probably 20, 2014, 2013, 2014. And I remember meeting, you know, with a number of heads of state and finance ministers, and they really stopped talking about growth. And they were talking about job and job creation, and fear of, of digitization and digital disruption, and what that meant. And I think what that's manifested itself in, in my words, is a form of protectionism where countries today are trying to, you know, protect their jobs. And I think that has created uh, borders and boundaries. And I think, um, you know, created uh, or manifested itself in the form of, of trade wars. You know, people often talk about, you know, the end of globalization. I don't, I don't see that. And again, as a, a company that, that operates in a hundred countries and I'll use China is the example. Um, you know, when we saw uh, tariffs put in place uh, in both directions, we saw uh, reactions to that. And so one was that we saw manufacturing that had been traditionally done in China uh, move to places like India or Mexico. We saw supply chains shift because you can't, you know, running just in time in inventories you, you can't allow for those disruptions. And so we've seen trade corridors uh, and we've seen different pieces shift. And I think it's really brought a, a sense of urgency around the nimbleness. And I think as part of that, companies like our, our serve an important role in terms of being able to, to help our clients through those challenges in all the places that we work. I, I think as part of that, it, it's not likely, Lee, in my opinion, to, to go away. I think you know the pressures on uh, economies, the pressures on jobs, 
the pressures on government officials and politicians will stay there. And I think likely that sensitivity is likely to remain heightened. Gotcha. The, uh, I know that when Brexit was voted and Google did a survey, the majority of people in the UK didn't know what Brexit was all about, yet they voted to leave. Uh, leave. Um, it's now back on the front page in the UK. Uh, how is Citigroup preparing for Brexit and how are we managing the risks around the potential that other countries favor isolationism over globalism? So, so one is when you, you look at our model, uh, yes, while our European headquarters is in the UK, we physically operate in the ground in 21 out of 26 EU countries. And so we have on the ground presence. And in many cases, we've been there for, for decades or more. So um, we have the advantage of, you know, we haven't, you know, been a briefcase bank where we come and go. We actually operate and have had the in infrastructure on the ground. Um, as part of that, you know, while our, um, while our headquarters is in the UK, our bank vehicle is in Ireland, so it passports to all of Europe already. And we have a trading operation in Frankfurt, uh, which we simply added to in terms of uh, some of the necessities around that. Uh, and so uh, I think we've had, we've had good flexibility. We'll, we'll see where it goes. I would say that you know, our own expectation is that with a no deal exit becoming increasingly uh, more likely, we estimate that you know, domestic bank earnings in the UK um, could be significantly you know, uh, impeded or, or hurt. Um, but we feel like we're pretty well positioned and our focus has been, and we are ready for uh, ensuring continuous and consistent service for both our EU and UK clients, regardless of outcome. Gotcha. I left this question for the last. We spent 42 minutes, you being a great sport, responding to a lot of questions. This last one could probably, we could spend another 40 minutes. We're about just under a month away from a presidential election. The regulatory and political cycle in the U.S. are closely intertwined. If the Democrats win both the House and the Senate, what would it mean for the banking industry? I guess I could ask if the president retains control, what does that mean for the banking industry? Uh, I, I, you, you sit in a different position than me. You know, you're, you run a big company. I'm a pretty, pretty private guy, so I could probably be more open, but what, what, what do you got to say about the election? Anything that you feel comfortable saying? Well, you know, first I would say that, you know, uh, as you just described, we are an apolitical institution. We're a 200 year old institution that's managed through, you know, Republican, Democrat. We've managed through world wars. We've managed through lots of things. Um, and I think that, you know, from our perspective, you know, we're, we're, we're not partisan. Our, our job is to, to do our job. And I think that we are. And I think the banks in the U.S. are doing a, a terrific job at that. I think as part of that, um, we do need to continue to tell our story of the things we do and the, the value that we provide to society. Um, and, you know, in fact, I had a, a number of calls, you know, with uh, people, uh, a number of, of our leaders, political leaders in Washington today, talking about the economy, talking about a, a number of things in terms of where we are, you know, the next round of stimulus and really, uh, if that comes, where it should be targeted, how it, how it should, be, should be sized. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think as, as part of that, um, you know, when, when we, we look at kind of where we are, um, you know, going on to four years into President Trump, I, I think from a, a banking perspective, um, uh, the larger banks really haven't gotten and nor have we really asked for much rollback in terms of regulation. I would say that new regulation coming over the transom has, has uh, you know, definitely uh, subsided or stopped under President Trump, but, you know, not much of, of anything has gone away and that's, that's fine. And I think that um, you know we would need to see if if the Democrats were to come into power, do they have a do they have a different view in terms of that? And I, and I would say you know from that in terms of the conversations we have, I think that in general they're they're comfortable where the banking industry is and, and the big banks. But um, again, we'd have to see once they're in office what they choose to do. And I would just finish Lee, and, and you know this that you know. Um, Campaign rhetoric is, is not always um, reality rhetoric once you're in office. 
And so I think we, we've got to kind of drill, drill through really what's being said and what we actually think has the ability to come to fruition. Well, on that score, I quote Will Rogers, a satirist, who said that if politicians delivered 10% of what they promised, there would be no need for heaven. So uh, the one thing that I find humorous, you know, negative interest rates have not worked in Japan or in Europe. You know, president is yelling about negative interest rates. And when I just saw his recent balance sheet, I can understand why he wants negative interest rates. <laughs> Anyway, you've been a great sport. Uh, uh, I want to tell you, I have a feeling you're sitting in your office right now in Manhattan. Is that, is yes, that back yep. Okay. In retirement, you can look at my background. You know, your next background is going to be like my, but I want to tell all the viewers, that's a virtual background. I'm sitting in my basement in my house in Short Hills, and that's the, a, a virtual background. But um, let me see if I, there were questions here. Uh, I think that the open questions were dealt with. So uh, I don't know where to hit a chat button. Thank you for joining. Please remember to submit questions for Leo. Okay, so uh, does anybody at NJPAC want to handle the questions? I don't have any questions on my end. Hi, Lee. I could ask all those questions. We have a couple questions. And uh, the first one is for Michael. Um, a salute to you and the city team for the recent announcement of your Action for Racial Equity Initiative. Can you elaborate a bit more on its strategies and goals. Sure. So, for those of you who hadn't haven't seen it, a, a week and a half, or, um, ten days ago or so, we announced uh, a billion dollar program that would focus on a number of pillars in terms of uh, racial equity. And you know, uh, one uh, was um, you know creating a an investment fund to be able to fund uh, black owned and started entrepreneurial businesses to. Uh, dedicate, you know, we have been uh, and will continue to be, uh, while not necessarily the, the largest uh, real estate lender in the United States, we have been, I think it's now for 10 consecutive years, um, the number one lender in terms of affordable ho housing. And with our initiative, we'll, we'll be, fo be focusing even more in some of the more challenged neighborhoods and areas uh, around trying to create better and more proper housing. Uh, I've personally taken on and have been working uh, in Washington around uh, trying to, to get more resources to our MDIs, to our minority depository institutions. And so uh, we announced a hundred billion, a hundred million dollars would be going uh, into, uh, into capital, into lending, into helping them uh, try because in these neighborhoods that they serve, if they don't have the ability to do that, you in times like this create a blight that actually never uh, corrects itself. Uh, you know, again, kind of working through a, a number of work streams and initiatives to uh, really try and make make a difference. So we're we're excited about it. Uh, we've already stood it up. We're bringing it to life, and uh, and we look forward to reporting more on it in the future. Good. Further questions from New York, from New Jersey, I should say. Yes, we have one more question, and it is, can you speak to the significance of City hiring the first woman to lead a major U.S. bank? Well, per, first, I would say that, yes, Jane is a woman, but Jane did not get this job because she's a woman. She got it because she is, uh, in, in my eyes, in the board's eyes, um, far and away, you know, the, the qualified person to do it. And if you look at uh, Jane's career and 16 years ago, I was responsible for bringing her into the company and throughout my career, I've, I've been proud and happy to work with her. And in my tenure as CEO, I've, I've moved her through a number of opportunities from running our private bank to running our mortgage business coming out of the crisis to going down and taking over and restructuring our Latin America business and most recently to taking over our consumer business. So she's had a, a great exposure to our firm. Uh, she is really liked and highly respected. And, and um, I think she's going to She's going to do a, a great job. And uh, again, all of us couldn't be more proud of her. I think as part of that, I think it is overdue that we have uh, a woman in running one of the, the large banks. And, and again, I, I think in there, you know, what we know is, is we look at diversity and inclusion. Um, nothing beats having role models in place that people can look at and see are real and know that they've broken through whatever ceilings and whatever challenges have been there 
And I think, you know, Jane is not just a great example for the people and diverse talent inside our firm, but I think across the industry. And as I said, we, we just couldn't be prouder. Thank you, Michael. Um, those are our questions for the evening. So, Lee, if you have anything else, it, oh, I it, just it's wanted up to you. To, I want to thank Michael again for virtually crossing the Hudson. It is very interesting, very informative. And I congratulate him on his uh, next uh, chapter in his life. It's been very interesting since 1983, getting out of Harvard, Solomon, Citibank. You're like me, you have a very short resume. You know, uh, I spent 25 years at Goldman and 26 years running Omega, and now I'm retired and I'm happy I have no responsibility to anybody but myself and uh, try to do good things with the money I've made. But you stay healthy, stay safe, and uh, again, thank you very much for your availability. Much appreciated. Lee, thank you, and thank Ron you to everyone from NJPAC.